Okay, so um, budget. The scenario that I've uh, made up today is that we have a grand opportunity. It's due tomorrow morning, and uh, we already had a narrative prepared, luckily, because we stole a narrative from another grant application we did, and we're going to try to recycle an idea that we already have. So I'm lucky I have the narrative already written. This budget amount I can apply for is $125,000, okay? With that amount of money, I'm making a kind of quick decision. I can afford to hire a couple staff. Every project that I do includes interns. I'm going to need some travel to get around. I'm going to need to buy equipment. I'm going to need supplies. I'm going to have to hire someone to help me. And I want to try to recover some indirect expenses because it makes certain people at the college very happy when I do so, OK? Uh, if you're familiar with that concept, uh, I can go ahead and say it. Uh, Mr. Monero likes it when I bring in indirect uh, cost recovery to the college, so, okay. So about 125,000 budget, uh, I'm just going to kind of walk through this, how I would do this. Doing this outside of a spreadsheet is a bad idea, okay, uh, because you're going to make mathematical errors and the spreadsheet would allow you to do it correctly. So let's say I'm going to have two staff. I'm going to just put a number here. I made a, a column quantity one. I'm going to figure out what their base salary wage is. And let's say for staff number one, that's going to be $35,000 a year. Staff number two, let's say that's going to be $45,000 a year. Sometimes when you do grants, you'll have staff that may not be 100% allocated. Uh, maybe you're going to have a staff person work part-time, so you would have to sort of figure that out. I'm going to keep it easy. In this case, I'm just going to say 100%. Nice. I, I subconsciously typed 110%. Okay. Uh, and that would be true for salaried employees that uh, you might actually be putting 110% in, but you're not going to get paid anything extra for doing that. Uh, this next column can cause a lot of, lot of issues, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So what's known as the fringe benefit rate is something that you have to calculate. Now, when you're doing a grant, um, if you're using existing staff that currently work for you, you can calculate down to the exact percentage what that fringe benefit rate is. How many of you know what goes into a fringe benefit rate? What are some things you think would go into that? Health insurance, Health insurance retirement, FICA. FICA. What's FICA? Andrew. Social Security, Social Security and, Medicare. and Medicare, correct. Um, it also includes, I believe, there could be for some employers that include, could include unemployment insurance, okay? Uh, what are some other things? There's still more. What's that? Time off? Nope. <coughs> That's just calculated your 100% of your salary would calculate in your vacation time into that. Um, you don't have to allocate that out separately, vacation time or sick time. Okay. Um, Holidays you not allocate separately. Let me say, let me say retirement. retirement. Erica said retirement. There's vision, dental, um, you know, all the different insurances that would apply there. So typically, um, a, a pretty much standard off the top rate would be 30 percent, but that does vary. For example, you could have one staff member picks the sort of the low cost health insurance plan, and then it's a less money. Another um, employee could pick the high cost insurance plan. So here at the college, our rates vary in this salary range anywhere between 26 to 34 um, percent. If you have an employee that makes more money, um, let's say, I don't know, someone's making double that, what do you think that would do to the fringe benefit rate? Well, it would probably drop it down. Why is that? Why would it well, be lower? That's correct. So if you're making, say, 20 grand a year and your health insurance is 2,000 a year, that's 10 percent. But if you're making 80 grand a year, that's only 2.5 percent. So that can throw you off sometimes if you just use arbitrary numbers. But let's say in this case, we don't know who we're going to hire. We don't know what fringe benefit rate they're going to pick. You know, putting a number like 30 percent will, will cover you. And sometimes, though, at the end of the grant cycle, you'll end up paying more than that in fringe. And that's just something that you have to 
kind of be prepared to deal with. So I'm going to type in a uh, fringe benefit rate of 30%, but I'm just going to put in um, 0 0.30 because I'm going to use this in a calculation. So to then calculate my total salary and benefits, I put these out here in gray because I have to do some kind of sub-calculations outside of the spreadsheet to pull that number in. So to figure out the total salary, in this case, uh, since it's not a percentage, it would actually be 35000 And then for staff number two, it would be 45000 But the benefit rate, I would have to take the total salary, so I would use a formula inside the spreadsheet. I would just type equals the total salary times the fringe benefit rate, and then I simply hit enter, and that tells me that my benefit rate is going to be $10,500 for that employee. And then in Excel, it's really handy. You can just grab this lower bar here and drag it down one, and it automatically populates the formula below, and that rate for the second employee would be 13500 Now I can come back to my total salary benefit, and that equals then the total salary plus the benefit rate, hit enter, and again, I can just drag that calculation down. That 125,000 bucks is going pretty quick here, okay? So the next thing is, uh, I would look at my interns. Now you'll notice that I have interns academic and interns summer. Do any of you have an idea why I would have two separate columns for my interns? No, no. Well, what's the difference between an intern being paid during the academic year and an intern being paid in the summer? What's that? No. No. What? FICA is correct. Now, Brad knows this because he's worked for me in the summer. So during the academic year, according to federal law, the college does not have to deduct FICA costs for a student because they're an academic program. In the summertime, you have to pay FICA. So if you forget that, it's going to end up, you know, uh, dinging you at the end. So let's say I'm going to go ahead and hire, and typically for me, I would put in, I'm going to hire eight interns uh, during the school year. My, let's say my base salary rate is $10 per hour. Um, my interns typically work 10 hours per week. There's 15 weeks in the academic semester times two semesters would be a total of 30 weeks times 10 hours per week would be 300 hours per intern. Does that sound right? So I would go ahead and put in 300 hours. There is no fringe benefit rate, so I can simply calculate the total salary benefit as being equal eight interns times $10 an hour per intern times 300 hours. So my intern cost is going to be $24,000. Now, if I'm looking to maintain the same level of intern commitment in the summer as I am during the school year, during the school year, four interns would equal 40 hours a week. During the summer, an intern would work probably 40 hours a week. So I really only need two interns in the summer to equal eight interns during the academic year. So I'm just going to put in two interns in the summer. I'm actually going to pay them more because I try to subsidize the housing expenses of my interns and the way I do that in the grant is I just pay them more, okay? So I'm going to pay my interns $12 during the summer. Interns in the summer, it would be a 12-week internship at 35 hours per week equals 420 hours times two. So my total number of hours in the summer will be 840 hours. I have to put in the fringe benefit rate, so for FICA, that would be 7.65% FICA rate. So I'm going to type in 0 0.0765. And then now I have to use the column over here. So my total salary is going to equal two interns times $12 per hour times 840 hours. And then my benefit rate salary will be that total salary times 0 0.0765 and then I total that up equals that plus this hit enter okay now if I want to I can do a little subtotal right here 
just by selecting all of those and hitting the auto sum in an Excel spreadsheet. And I can already see I'm up to $149,000, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of running in the hole a little bit on this grant, okay? <laughs> However, I'm going to press forward and ignore that, okay? Because someone out there is going to give me money as match, right? A generous donor. Now, travel, um, this always gets a little bit tricky. Um, so whenever you get a grant, you know, unless you're going to be sitting in your cubicle and never leaving, you're going to have some travel. And let's say in this particular grant, we have to go out and, and do some field work, and maybe we're going to present it at a conference, so we have to add these things in. So I'm just going to say that we're going to do maybe 500 miles of travel, and then the cost of that travel, how many of you know what the current IRS mileage reimbursement rate is? How much? No, it's not. Now, you said 51 cents because that's all you're getting. So the IRS, no, but I'm serious, there's a difference. So the IRS has a rate for mileage reimbursement for nonprofit organizations that is 51 cents per mile. However, if you apply for a grant that comes into the college, the official IRS rate for businesses is 0.555. So in a grant that you're applying for, you would put the higher mileage rate at 0.555 and you would get reimbursed that. However, if you're traveling for the college using college funds, you're only going to get 0 0.51. Does that make sense? Doesn't seem fair? That's the way it is, okay? So I'm going to put in 0 0.555, and that changes every year, okay? So every year you would have to check, and sometimes they predict in advance, like what's the rate going to be for 2014? It's probably already been announced, and there have been years where that's changed during the middle of the year based on escalating gas prices. So it's just something you have to consider. Tolls, how many of you go across the Bay Bridge? How much does it cost now? When's it going up? Goes to eight. So you might want to kind of guess that. You'd be surprised if you make 10 trips across the Bay Bridge. Let's just put in 10, and we'll just guess eight bucks. And it depends on what bridge you go across. You're trying to get into downtown Baltimore, you're going to go, you're going to get dinged twice going underneath the, the, the Harbor Tunnel each way, and then once coming back, so it could add up to a lot more. I'm just going to put eight there. Parking, you ever been in downtown Baltimore? Can you park for free? No, it costs like 12 bucks. If you're going to make five trips to Baltimore, let's say five trips, you're going to put in 12 bucks per trip. Uh, what if you got to get a hotel in D.C. for a meeting that starts at 7 a.m.? Do you want to drive to D.C. at 3 a.m. in the morning? It is, but the answer to that question is no. Now, if you know you're going to be in D.C., what's the, what's the cost of a hotel in D.C. versus a hotel in Podunk, Pennsylvania? Yeah, it's about $2.50 a night, and that's for a marginal hotel, not necessarily a first class. But let's say we're going to do two nights a hotel, $250 a night. How about meals? We're going to be on the road traveling. I myself, as some of you may know, uh, I do like to eat when I'm traveling. So, um, you know, you could put in a per diem rate, which, which our college doesn't have. Some colleges actually have a per diem rate per city. So if you were going to Podunk, Pennsylvania, the per diem rate might be 32 bucks because food's cheap in Podunk, Pennsylvania. But if they know you're going to D.C., the per diem rate might be $65, okay? Because food's more expensive in D.C., as many of you already know. I'm going to say we're going to D.C., so I'm going to estimate basically we need maybe three days per diem at $65 a day. But in this particular case, there's going to be three of us going, you know, or something like that. So I'm just going to leave it simple there. How about airline? We're going to a conference in Fort Lauderdale. What'd your air ticket cost, Erica? 200 bucks. And that's if you planned in advance, right? I mean, a ticket now to Fort Lauderdale is like 400 bucks. You mean you just you just went down there? You just flew down there, right? Do you get it for 200 bucks? 250. So let's say two air tickets at 250. And then what we can do here to calculate that really quickly, over here we just put the formula in, our quantity times the cost per unit, hit enter, and then we can sit here and calculate this for the whole cell, and then we can do a sum total. So we've added $1,600 for travel, which doesn't seem like too much, but if you forget some of those things, that means you're paying it out of your own pocket. Now equipment. I'm hiring two staff. I'm going to have eight interns. I'm going to need two computers per intern, two computers for staff. That's going to be four computers. So I'm going to type in computers. I think you lost the people behind you. What's that now? I think you lost the 
Did I lose some people there? Yes, sir. All right. So if I'm hiring two staff to work on a project, I need one computer per staff, right? I'm hiring eight interns. I'm hoping they don't all show up at the same time, but I'm probably going to need about two computers for the interns and definitely two in the summer. So I can justify a total purchase of four computers, okay? So I'm going to put in four computers. Now this project is a super high-tech project, so Andrew, what our last, uh, what's our super computer cost? The one that uh, we got an $8,000 video card for free for? Yeah, and if we actually paid for the video card, it would have been eleven thousand five hundred dollars. And I, I'm of the opinion that well, that's the kind of horsepower that we need. So I'm going to go ahead and reach for the moon. And you think that's a lot of money, but I'm telling you, some of the stuff we're doing in the lab these days, uh, it's not. Do we need any other equipment, Andrew? So we need we need UPSs, and they're running. Uh, we'll need four of those. They're running about what? Two fifty? Two hundred bucks? So we'll put 125. What else do we need in the lab really bad that, that, you know, what else do we really want? We gotta have it for this grant. Well, that's okay. what, what else do we need? What's the problem we have in the lab right now we'd love to solve with this grant? Recycling bins. Recycling bins, not equipment. <laughs> what did you say there, Stephanie? What did you say? More space, okay. We, we'll deal with that. Let's say we need a, well, furniture, that's not equipment per se. Are you going to put the computers on? Yeah, some tables. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to go to the Terrapin Trader again. 50 bucks a table, okay. Well, it would be really nice if we had a new backup system for our data. What do you think about that? Backup storage unit. I'm dreaming for the moon here. What's a new backup storage system going to cost us, Andrew? So let's go ahead and put 45, okay? So I'm just going to rest at that, and again, I'm just going to take my quantity times the equipment price, hit enter, scroll down on that, and now I'm going to have to make some space here under supplies and printing, and total that up. Now I'm up to $91,500. How about supplies, printing? Two staff, eight students, that's a lot of post-its, pens, tablets of paper, um, paper clips, ink for the plotter. What do you think I should put there? You already have the plotter. Ink for the plotter. I already have the plotter. Actually, we need a new plotter, but I'm not going to bother to put it in there. That would be 20000 bucks for a new plotter. I'm just going to guess roughly, this is what I do when I sit back late at night, I go, that would be about uh, $2,500, okay? So I'm going to just go miscellaneous, because you need this stuff, and it's, it's really hard to predict. Most people who um, would do this would not, you don't have to sit there and justify, I'm going to buy 10 boxes of paper clips, I'm going to buy 16 packs of post-it notes. I mean, people understand that you need some miscellaneous supplies. How about contractual labor? This is going to be an advanced application, we're going to need to pull in some consultants, maybe our friends at Geographit. Uh, to do some programming work for us that Brad can't figure out or Fish can't figure out on their own. So let's just say I'm going to put in uh, geographic here and I'm going to go ahead and budget. That's going to be about $35,000 of consulting. So then I go ahead and total up my direct expenses because everything I've listed here so far is what's considered a direct expense. Now, since you guys mentioned a very important thing, I'm going to go insert, insert, and I'm going to go other direct because we could use more space, Stephanie. And there's actually an office suite available at the business park that I've already checked out. Rent is a direct expense. Now, if you're applying for a grant from the college, you cannot put rent in because the college is providing the space for you. Our offices are located in the business park. We pay rent separate from the college, so we can put rent in as a direct expense, and in fact, we do that. So I'm going to go ahead and put in to rent that space, 1,500 square foot of second floor space, approximately $10 per square foot. It's going to run me about $18,000 for the space 
already have a quote. And I'm just going to drop this over here, $18,000. Now what about, uh, what other costs will I have with that new space, Stephanie? What other bills do I have to pay? Utilities. I got to pay electric, right? Probably got to put a... Yeah, I got wiring I got to put in. I got to pay for new internet. Uh, I got to hire, I got to pay Nicole more money to come clean the place for us. And quite frankly, she probably should come in twice a week as is now. Um, security, you know, security cost. Uh, telephone, need more telephone services. Are any of those direct expenses? Maybe if I had to buy new telephones or buy a new security system, I could put those in as direct expenses. But your electric bill, the janitorial bill, the cost for infinity recycling, our internet services, those are all what are considered indirect expenses, and you cannot charge those as a direct expense. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more when I get to indirect. But for right now, I'm going to total my direct expenses, which would then be my salaries plus my travel plus my backup storage plus my supplies plus my consulting, and I'm going to cheat here and just steal that number from there. And oops, what did I do wrong? Oops, I'm up to $298,314. How much did I say our budget was? All right, so this is the beauty of a spreadsheet. Okay, I uh, guess um, staff number two, uh, out of there. Uh, oh, down to 239. Uh, maybe only four interns, one in the summer. Um, we're going to stay at the Super 8. And uh, that trip to Florida to present at that conference, I guess we're going to have to do without that. The $11,500 computer is a little bit out of our budget. We're going to drop down to those uh, $780 cheap ass Dell computers. And the backup storage unit, 173, uh, that's not going to work for this grant, so we're going to delete that. Now we're down to 128. Ooh, it's getting a little bit closer, right? So I'm going to go geographic. Which is more important, the consultant or the rent? You're wrong. The consultant, okay? <laughs> the consultant's more important. Yeah. We're going to get a little more cozier, okay? Like, Stephanie, you got room for three more interns in your office, okay? <laughs> Don't laugh. It could happen. Your desk is pretty big right now. Yeah. Yeah. That little L part of your desk, we could have another student sit there, you know? Now we don't have to go so far, you can just go, hey. <laughs> so we're going to dump the rent, okay? Because, and quite honestly, this is a very complex grant, and if we don't have the consulting thing that we need, we may not be able to finish the product. So the consultant's more important. So now I have to kind of go back in since I messed my formula up. I deleted that reference. I can just come up here and delete that in the formula. Now we're down to $110,000. Our budget was one twenty-five. dollars So if you remember, we want to try to get some indirect cost recovery from Mr. Monero so he's happy and uh, doesn't bug me so much. Now. If this is a federal grant, the college has what's called a negotiated federal indirect cost recovery rate. That rate is 44% for the college. Now, we're off campus, so we actually can use what's known as the off-campus indirect rate, which is 20%. That indirect not only includes electricity, internet, phone services, but it also includes the cost with payroll, paying your bills, um, HR expenses. There's a lot of little hidden costs. And our, our basically our business office negotiates this with the federal government and justifies what that cost rate is. Our rate of 44% is actually relatively low for college or universities. Some colleges have a negotiated federal rate of 58%. Okay? Now, some grants may cap your indirect. They'll say, we don't care what your negotiated indirect rate is. The, we're only going to pay 10%. And then some grants say, quite specifically, we're just not paying indirect, period. Okay? So that's all in the grant, and you have to kind of learn to deal with that. Um, 
Which one do you think Mr. Monero would prefer? That's correct. You have a question? So is this like the one that falls just off the top or something? That's correct. Okay. Like you'll never see this as the project director, okay? That's correct. So your budget's really 56000 So if I apply that 44% indirect rate to this, let's say it will go at the top. So if I just come out here and calculate, if I take my program budget of 110000 times a 0.44% indirect rate, and then I add those two together, my total cost plus my, where did it go? All right, hold on, I messed up here. All right, I got to give myself a little more space there. So that equals my total direct cost times my indirect cost at 44%. See how great spreadsheets are? Let's try this again. So it equals this plus that. So now I'm at 158,000, but the grant's only for 125. So what do you think I would do immediately? No, I would go to Mr. Monero and I would say, Jim, will you allow me to apply for this grant and not get the full indirect rate? And you can have that kind of negotiations with the business department, but if he said no, what would be my alternative? What's that? That's correct. That's the only thing you could do. So let's pretend it's no. And, um, you know, so now we're down to like two interns. And, you know, that 35, that's a lot for a staff member. I bet you, you know, maybe a, a recent grad I could probably get for 28000 And uh, clearly the 35000 that's going to have to drop down to fifteen. And what did I do? How come I didn't recalculate? Oh, I got to put it here. So now I'm at 121. I'm going to pump a little bit more. Which would you prefer, more for the consultant or raise the salary of the staff? What's that? Uh, you're saying consultant? I'm going to go like 29,000 for the staff. And. So I don't know if that actually changed or not, but yeah, it's pretty close, okay? Really, what I would do is I would go and negotiate with Mr. Monero, okay? And say, look, Jim. So, anyway. Is so, there a time for a grant when you're on campus that the negotiation is at 44% or is it just that? Okay, so everything in life is negotiable. <laughs> Mr. Monero has been very supportive of um, faculty and staff going after grants, and he understands that, um, you know, as you're first starting out and you're trying to, you know, get some stuff going, that he does have a, a willingness to negotiate with you on that. Now, you know, once you land your second million dollar grant, you know, he's probably gonna wanna crack down, but he's been worked very well with us over the past five years. Um, but eventually, like, the college does need that indirect you know, to, to help us, you know, operate and things like that. And, um, you know, it, it is what it costs us if you go through and look at the formula, it's, it's been vetted. Um, I, I typically use a 20% for my operations because I, I always try to charge rent as a direct expense. So if you charge rent as a direct expense, you have to use the 20% off campus rate. Now, in your grant, if you have potential partners, so let's say some of these salaries are being paid to a different institution, the salaries that are being paid to partners outside of Washington College would automatically be charged at the 20% indirect rate, or sometimes on an NSF grant, the entire amount would be subject to the indirect rate of the other institution. And then in a National Science Foundation grant, what would happen is in Fast Track and NSF, you would prepare what's known as, a, I think it's called a multi-application. So you would submit Washington College portions of it their research office would submit their portion of it. You would submit simultaneously, and that way the monies for the other institution would go directly to them. They would deal with the indirect, and that is much preferable for Washington College. Otherwise, we would have to get all the money 
And then we have extra costs incurred to then transfer that money to other institutions. So I found this out the hard way on something I did a couple years ago that I did it the totally wrong way. Um, so, but Jim is very uh, much willing to negotiate and uh, you just have to talk to him sooner than the day that it's due on, you know, NSF or grants.gov. Um, but he's pretty amenable to that, especially if you're going after some big stuff. It isn't, you know, somebody new, um, but I cannot speak for Mr. Monero. So, so any other questions about budgets? Did I forget something? You have to double check your program narrative. Because if you're cutting your funding, most likely you're going to cut the work that you're promising you're going to do. Yeah. Don't keep the same promises if you're going to cut your funding. It happens too often. Yeah. Funder will come back to you and say, okay, here's your budget, but I'm only going to give you 8% of it. And you say, okay. No, I'm, I'm just going to say in the narrative that my staff and interns are going to work twice as hard. <laughs> now, there's one other thing at the college that you would have to do with this. And I get this question frequently from Mr. Monero. Um, so let's say you're lucky and you get this grant, right? And then you get the grant contract and it comes in and the grant contract is not executed until Mr. Monero signs it. So any contract or grant over $5,000 at Washington College has to be approved by Mr. Monero. So guess what the first question he asks when I give him something like this? What's that? No, that's what Mitchell asks, you know. <laughs> What's the college's cut? He doesn't ask me that anymore because I now include that figure in correspondence, okay? Um, what do you think Mr. Monero is going to ask? Stu Bruce, certified accountant, just did this entire budget, right? What's Mr. What do you think Mr. Monero is going to ask me? Bingo, <laughs> okay? Because I, I actually, I hate accounting, okay? And did I make a mistake in this? I actually know I did because I changed some numbers there and it wasn't changing at the bottom, you know, so something was wrong. So what you have to do with these budgets is, and again, always best to do it prior to submission, is you would take it to the business office and you would show it to Debbie Gannon in the business office and she would review the budget. She would validate that you're using the right fringe benefit rates or there's any other flaws in it, she would look at the whole budget and then she would say it's okay. And that way when Mr. Monero emails me, you can go, <coughs> of course. <laughs> Debbie Gannon looked at it. And if you don't do that, then what you do is you really quickly send Debbie Gannon an email saying it's like, hey, does this budget look okay? So at any rate, uh, Debbie's been very supportive and actually all the grants and um, like that are run through the business office. Debbie Gannon is the one who does the financial reporting, and our business office is actually getting ready to hire a new full-time person that will be dedicated to working on these grants because when you finish the project, typically what's going to happen to this budget or to what you did? It's going to be audited, audited okay? And my experience with audits, I, I'll tell you a little story. I, I remember uh, many, many moons ago, I got a small grant when I was working at Mifflin County for 20,000 bucks, very small. Finished the grant, someone from the state of Pennsylvania showed up and said, I'm here to audit your grant. Can I see all your paperwork? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I got, I got paperwork for everything. Well, where is it? Well, you know, it's, uh, I think it's down there in uh, Jeannie's office, you know, and so, <clears throat> Went down to Jeannie and said, hey, Jeannie, uh, you got that paperwork for all this money I spent? She goes, well, it's in my, one of them file cabinets there. And about eight hours later, <laughs> uh, the auditor was satisfied that I basically screwed up in several different places, but he was really nice, and he knew I wasn't trying to, you know, cheat the government or anything like that. I was just a very poor paperwork person. And, um, and immediately when he walked out the door, I think within one week, I had hired a part-time grant administrator person whose sole mission was to make my next audit a pleasurable experience. And I remember the same guy came in several months later and I went, um, Jody was her name, and I said, Jody, the auditor's here. And she's like, no problem, pulls the drawer out, 
Auditor comes in, he was out the door in 15 minutes, she had every single thing lined up. That's what Debbie Gannon does for you, okay? She's got books on it, the auditors come in, and all the paperwork's there. Because if you fail an audit, what's going to happen to you the next time you try to apply for a grant? Yeah, no one likes to give money to people who can't manage the money. And actually, like, let's say you get a big federal grant, and let's say you totally mess it up, right? And the auditor comes in, and they, they write up the college. That means then later on when uh, you know, Brad goes for a federal grant, they're going to go, well, you're actually temporarily disqualified based on your ability. You know, so it's really important that you have that taken care of. So, any, any other questions about the budget at all? It's more fun than a barrel full of monkeys, let me tell you. But uh, it's an essential part of any grant that you apply for. So. Let, me, let me ask you, on the, the basic premise there was you knew there was $125,000 out there? Yeah, basically, I mean, I was using a scenario of there's a grant, the max you can apply for is 125 grand. You know, I'm going to go for 125, right? Yeah. You know, like so, I, I. So there are limits sometimes set that, I mean, yeah. I think there's not limits sometimes set, there's limits usually always set. Really? Yeah, that's very standard for a grant that, you know, the max you can apply for might be 25 grand or 100 grand. And often, you know, when you apply for the max amount, you know, sometimes you want to go under that amount because you know they only have enough to make four awards and you know there's going to be 20 people applying. And if you apply for a little bit less, you know, but then there's other times that, you know, they got a ton of money and you got a great idea and you're going to smoke the competition then you might as well go for the full amount, you know, so. And then sometimes the grantors, if they're a little short on cash, they'll come back to you and say, can you, can you negotiate, can we shave a little bit, you know, so I, I lean towards asking for the full entire amount on any grant I apply for, so. Can you so. talk to us about match? Yeah, I can talk to you about match. I mean, what do you want to know? Well, I, I mean, it's, it's a phrase I've heard since I've been, you know, kind of, kind of, Okay. Well, there, there's really two kinds of match. There's what's known as in-kind match, okay. where you use your staff time, for example. Um, so let's say, and I do this a lot, uh, the grant that we just applied for, uh, I put all my time into that grant as in-kind staff match. I also took the liberty of taking Dr. Seidel's time and putting that in as in-kind staff match. Um, there was no requirement for match in this particular grant, but showing that we were matching actually improved our chances of getting the grant. I also um, convinced uh, Mr. Monero to waive the 44% indirect, and I went with a 15% indirect, and I used the difference between the 15% and the 44% as match. In other words, the college is still incurring these expenses, but I could use it match. So I ended up applying for a $40,000 max grant. We went at 36000 because in the wording it said, we strongly encourage people to ask for less than the maximum. And we strongly encourage people to show a match. So I went for 36, 153 instead of 40, and then I showed a $23,000 match, mm -hmm. which was in kind and then sort of savings from the indirect. Um, that, that's the God smiling. That's correct. But again, it's Mr. Monero being like, this is a new federal grant, and you know he sees some possibility. And of course, Dr. Seidel sent us supporting you know, email that this is a really important project for us. And, uh, you know, Jim's pretty reasonable um, to negotiate with, but not always gonna let me get away with that forever, you know, so. The other kind of match is a, uh, what we call a hard cash match. And those are often difficult to come up with, especially if you don't have any like you hard. You solicit a person's money. That's correct, yeah, yeah. There's a big grant I wanna go after. It's a Mar Maryland Area Heritage Authority grant. It's a, it's, you can get, um, $50,000 in grant, but you got to match it 100%. Of that 100%, only 15% of the match, or 15% of the total grant can be in kind. So for that grant, you like, come up with 35. yeah, you got to come up with $35,000 of cold, hard, green American cash. I don't have that. So I haven't actually applied for that grant for the last three years, but I've been thinking about it every year. And if anybody out there has an extra $35,000, I will apply this year. Uh, now, I, I will ask you this. Well, 1,000 per, 1,000 per, and I get up there, you know. Guy? What's that? Could I be the staff guy if I get you that much? The in-kind staff guy? <laughs> no, I'm not the staff guy. <laughs> you can be the in-kind staff guy. So. Uh, I have a quick question. 
Yes. So um, under equipment, so I'm trying to get funds to buy a huge piece of equipment that might cost about $120,000. Yes. So I need to be shopping around. Yeah, that's. Which company is going to give me the best deal? That's so correct. Have to present that in this budget? You would. You would in a grant, like for an equipment grant, you would have to show that, you know, basically you have, in other words, you didn't just go, I need 150 grand to buy an XYZ machine that's going to do great things. So whoever's going to review it's going to want to know, like, well, have you checked the prices, you know, things like that. And then for a piece of equipment that size, there might sometimes be requirements to have really issue an RFP and have people basically, you know, present proposals, which you'll have to document that you're buying. You know, as long as it meets the technical specs, you're going to go with the lower price. Unless you do your RFP document, Sometimes you do RFPs where you have price and then you have technical specs or performance of service. So you might have a Dell computer and a Lenovo computer, but maybe they're the, they look like they have the same specs. The Dells may be more expensive than the Lenovo, but based on the perform, your performance criteria review, the Dell is the machine that you really need to do the job. So then you can actually buy a more expensive machine, but it has to be justified. And you'll see that in RFPs where they ask you to submit your cost in one sealed envelope and your technical performance in another sealed envelope and then the people looking at the decision would look at the technical specs first make the decision based on technical specs then open the price up so you're not influenced by the price and uh, that's all how you word the RFP but I would suspect for a big big piece of equipment like that there'd be some additional requirements so Charlie can be the one to ask. I mean, they just got that, what, $350,000 mass spec. So he would know exactly what NSF wants for that. So yes? No, I mean, cold hard cash is cold hard cash no matter where it comes from. So I, I could submit a grant like that, 100000 and just say, I got the cash, you know. But it would be in the budget, and Jim Monero would like, me because I don't really have the cash. Okay, so you really have to have the cash, you know. Um, otherwise, at the end of the grant, when the audit happens, you're gonna, you know, fail. In that case, there would be like uh, many of the separate columns. So we'll say, the funding source you're going for, how much the budget comes from that, how much comes from your client. Yeah, if it's not coming from your organization, you have to have a letter that very specifically says, I'm ABC organization, and I'm giving XYZ $35,000 in cold hard cash for this grant. Otherwise, you have no proof that you have that uh, information. You have a question in the back? Um, is every grant The answer to that question is no. But just you will be willing to take charge. No, no, I'm, I mean, what, do you want to roll the die? No, I mean, it's like, uh, can every grant be audited? It actually depends on what the, what the grant is, but uh, like our state of Maryland grants, um, you know, we've had, what, eight GOCCP grants, two have been audited, mm -hmm. and uh, those audits caused us to revise our business practices, okay? So <laughs> we're, we're going to get audited again, okay? Yeah. It wasn't anything major, you know, but, uh, you know, the auditors found a couple things that they thought, we could have documented better, and we did a corrective action, and we, you know, shaped up. So you must be prepared for an audit. Now, if you get uh, bigger grants, like you get a million-dollar federal grant, the odds of you being audited are high. You know, you get a grant that's like ten grand, maybe the odds of you being audited are pretty low. But uh, you know, the college's reputation on how it deals with money, every single grant has to be handled the same way. Um, which is why the business office is, you know, heavily involved in that. So they're the ones that they sign their name under the financial certification. So their professional reputation is at stake. I mean, I'd go down too if it was wrong, but you know, I so would they. All right. So any other questions? All right. Well, we pretty much burned up the whole time. Do you do you have anything else you want to say? Cupcakes up front here.